Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the WSO2 Open Banking webinar series. So this is the first webinar uh, in our series. So this is in line with uh, the WSO2 Open Banking product version 1.5. Um, so I am Dasana, I am Director of Solutions Architecture, looking after multiple open banking solutions in the regions of Australia, New Zealand, and um, Singapore. I'm operating from the WSO2 Sydney office. And uh, Sachini Sirivardhana, who is a senior engineer and open banking expert in WSO2 open banking product team, is collaborating with me on this webinar in um, delivering our experiences and expertise. Um, moving on. So in this webinar, we will be looking at the, um, the CDS compliance, the Australian CDS 1.3 compliance, and, uh, and as well as we will be looking at the capabilities the WSO2 Open Banking pro product provides beyond the uh, compliance. Um, so we will be talking about uh, CDS compliance and the specific features around that uh, as the first item. And then we will look at the additional capabilities that the WC2 Open Banking platform provides beyond the compliance. And then I will take um, one or two user use stories or case studies from Australian um, market and explain the um, key learnings and value that we have provided. Um, with this, I will hand over the um, control to Sachini. Over to you. Okay, thank you, Dasana. So um, first, first off, uh, starting with an overview of the features which our WS2 Open Banking solution supports for banks to be compliant with the Consumer Data Standards spec. So what CDS or the consumer da data standards it means is it's the technical specification which provides a guideline in implementing, implementing the regulation introduced by the Australian government which requires the banks to share consumer data with data recipients with the consent of consumers. So uh, we have a few of the features which we support here. Let me give a brief introduction of each. So dynamic client registration is the process uh, through which the data recipients will onboard with the banks. So uh, as opposed to a manual registration approach, this is uh, sort of an automated one where uh, the, the data recipient will invoke an endpoint at the data holder's end. Uh, next up is the consent authorization, which is a um, very important point where the consumer will grant the permission to data recipients uh, for them to access the data. And token generation is uh, where the data recipient will obtain a key to access the CDR data. This will ensure that the data recipient is authorized to access that data. And consent validation uh, is where when invoking the CDR endpoints, uh, there are some validations which are done to check whether the status of the consent is valid and whether the data recipient can still access the consumer's data. Transaction security mainly deals with the mutual TLS as well as uh, holder of key validation, which will be discussed in detail in the upcoming slides. And uh, the consent date metadata management is this is also uh, something which is unique to the CDS. So it's like an additional layer of security which makes uh, which uh, makes the data, uh, data holders ensure that valid uh, the data recipients are still accredited or are still in a valid status to access the data and uh, the metrics api is uh, something which is accessed by the ACCC which is the regulatory body for the CDR uh, this is uh, to get the api statistics of the banks uh, which is mainly for reporting purposes So moving on to the dynamic client registration. So this diagram uh, gives an overview of what happens when a data recipient registers with the data holder. 
So first, uh, first of all, they have to be registered with the CDR register, which is the authoritative body for the CDR rules. And uh, there they will obtain a software statement accession, which is assigned JWT. And uh, after obtaining this signed JWT, they can invoke the data holders of DCR endpoint. So this registration request is also another signed JWT, which will contain the SSA as well. And the main validations that take place at the data holder's end is uh, the validation of the signature for the SSA as well as the request. And uh, the parameters sent in the request is also validated. So upon successful validation, the, the data recipient will receive a client ID, which they will uh, further use when um, going through the journey, uh, consent authorization step. So the next step is consent authorization. Uh, so this diagram gives an overview of the whole uh, process where the customer authorizes and the data holder accesses the data. This is basically based on the OIDC hybrid flow. Where first the client credentials were obtained via DCR. And uh, next up, the end user or the consumer should authorize the data recipients for obtaining their data. This is done by redirecting the consumer to the data holder's authorization application. And upon successful authorization with one or more factors, the consent will be displayed to the consumer. And uh, the, uh, this consent should explain the permissions that the data recipient is requesting from the consumer in simpler terms. So there is a data definition language which is mandated by the CDR consumer experience guidelines. And uh, this diagram is, uh, gives a high level overview of the whole process, as I mentioned. So once the authorization is successful, uh, the data recipient will receive an authorization code. And they can exchange that authorization code for an access token. And uh, in return, this access token, they can access uh, the CDR endpoints. So let's uh, take a deep, um, detailed view of what happens in consent authorization step. Sorry. So when the consent, uh, when the data recipient uh, redirects the consumer, first of First, all, first of all, the request is uh, received at uh, the WC2 Open Banking API Manager gateway. And then it's passed on to the WC2 Open Banking Key Manager, which handles the identity and access management details. And uh, further validations will take place from there onwards. So talking about uh, consent authorization, uh, this uh, request will also contain another signed JWT or JWT, which is known as the request object. So the request object uh, contains a claim called the sharing duration, which allows a data recipient uh, to which allows the data recipient to um, tell uh, the data holder this is the duration for which uh, I want to access the consumer's data. And uh, after this uh, validation of the request object is done, uh, we will further validate uh, the metadata of the data recipient. Uh, that is, the, whether the data recipient and the particular software product which belongs to them is in a valid status. So this is done by invoking uh, some of the ACCC endpoints. And uh, I will further explain it in detail in the uh, upcoming slide. So after this metadata validation is successfully done, the consumer can sign in using one or two factors. And then they will be able to see the consent, which they can approve or deny. And uh, after that, we will be storing a record of the consent data, such as the 
what sort of scopes they the consumer has given access to and what are the account ids the consumer has um, given access to and then after that uh, what happens is the request will be redirected to the data recipients uh, redirect URL with along with the authorization code. So a few points to mention here is like so far the specification mentions to facilitate only a single consent per data recipient and data holder and consumer. But uh, moving on from November 2020, support for concurrent consents uh, should also be implemented. And uh, they have uh, introduced a new claim uh, known as the CDR arrangement ID, which helps to identify a previously created consent. And so the purpose of introducing this is if a data recipient wants to revoke a previous consent, they can send this particular claim in the request object. And also this uh, arrangement ID is uh, something which should be returned by the data holder as a claim in the ID token when issuing the authorization code. And also uh, another new feature which is added is the pushed authorization request endpoint. And if a data recipient uh, wishes to either um, send the CDR arrangement ID as a parameter or else if the request object is likely too large to be sent as a URI parameter, they uh, can use this pushed authorization request endpoint. So these are uh, some of the upcoming features added in the latest release, which uh, our open banking solution will uh, comply to in future. And also uh, they have introduced another new endpoint called the CDR arrangement management endpoint. Uh, this should be implemented by both the data holders as well as the data recipients. And uh, this helps um, the data holder and the data, data recipient to revoke a consent which was created previously by uh, simply calling this endpoint uh, along with the particular arrangement ID, the consent can be revoked. Okay, so I hope everyone got a brief idea about the authorization process and Moving on to next step will be the token generation. So again, uh, the request will come to the API manager gateway and uh, we will check whether it's a valid grant type. And then, uh, as I mentioned before, the data recipient sends a claim called the sharing duration. So they have the option to send it or else uh, it can be blank as well. So if the sharing duration is sent, the value of this uh, sharing duration will be the validity period for the refresh token. And uh, the refresh token validity period will be bound to the sharing duration. And if no sharing duration claim was sent, we do not issue a refresh token as it will be a one-time consent. So, after the token is obtained, finally, the data recipient can invoke the CDR endpoints. Uh, so there are certain validations which will be done by the uh, open banking key manager. Uh, these include uh, uh, checking whether they have uh, the, the scope of the access token is uh, bound to the particular endpoint which they are invoking. And if it's not, uh, an error will be returned and they won't be allowed to access that endpoint. And uh, also we check whether the status of the consent is uh, an, in the authorized state. And uh, one, one more important thing is we also check uh, the status of data recipient and software product. Again, that those two are validated uh, in order to check whether the particular data recipient is still accredited in a valid status or in an active status to access the consumer's data. And also, uh, if the invocation contains an account ID, we check whether that account ID was previously uh, granted consent to by the consumer. 
So these validations will be done by the Open Banking Key Manager, Consent Validation API. And after successful validation of uh, the consent, the request will be redirected to the actual bank backend where the data recipient will receive the consumer's data. So that explains the basic journey for the uh, consent, uh, consent granting and data retrieval process. And next up, uh, we have uh, transaction security. So the specification mandates that uh, apart from the unauthenticated endpoints, the other endpoints uh, should be secured by mutual TLS. And uh, this is uh, supported by our open banking solution. And also it mentions a holder of key validation. So what happens here is when the access token is issued to the data recipient, uh, the transport certificate of the data recipient will be bound to the scope, to a scope of the access token. So once they invoke a particular API endpoint, the access token scope will be validated against the transport certificate belonging to the data recipient. So that's how uh, this validation is done. And uh, so talking about metadata validation, this is, uh, as I mentioned before, it's uh, something of some, some sort of additional security, which is mandated by the consumer data standards. And uh, uh, so this helps the data holder to ensure that uh, the data recipient is, uh, can be trusted further. So the ACCC uh, will maintain the status of data recipient and the status of the, the particular software product. Uh, as you can see, there's a status life cycle there, and it can be neither active, inactive, surrendered, revoked, or in, in any of these states. And uh, this uh, status can be changed by the ACCC or else uh, can be voluntarily changed by the data recipient itself. So uh, what we do is uh, we the data holder should uh, maintain these statuses, right? So we have a um, background, a uh, cron job, which maintains the statuses of the software product and the data recipient which will be done by this periodical metadata updater. And it invokes the endpoints exposed by HPLC for these purposes. We uh, invoke those endpoints, retrieve the data, and maintain the statuses there. And these statuses uh, should be checked uh, in the following situations. So um, we have to validate the statuses of the data recipient and the software product before we perform uh, the following responsibilities, which is uh, before we disclose any CDR data to the data recipient, and before consent authorization, uh, consent withdrawal. These three points uh, we should validate. And um, also, if by, by any chance the status of a data recipient is in a revoked or invalid or inactive status, uh, the data holder should expire the consent and uh, also clean up the registration. So these are the responsibilities the data, ho data holder should carry out. Okay, moving on to the metrics API. So this, uh, this is a requirement uh, in the CDS. Uh, which requires the data holders to expose an endpoint for the ACCC so that they can obtain operational statistics for metrics such as API performance, availability, errors, and so on. This is mainly for the purpose of reporting required by the ACCC. And we support this as well. This is supported through the WSO2 Open Banking Business Intelligence Server. So these are some of the data that will be given back to the ACCC in the response. Uh, for example, the availability of the API, 
performance, number of invocations, the average response time, the transactions per, uh, how many transactions were done, and uh, the number of customer regist registered with the data holder, the number of data requests that were rejected uh, due to the uh, traffic thresholds, uh, number of errors given out, and the number of sessions maintained. So uh, all these information will be given out in the response. And uh, so when invoking this API, the ACCC can pass a parameter called the period. Uh, it can be either current or historic. So if it's uh, current, uh, um, this is how it works. If for availability, it will be the current month. And all other metrics, it will be the present day. And if it's historic, for availability, it's the past 12 month data. And uh, for performance and all other aspects, uh, past seven days data will be returned. So this is a high level overview of uh, all the features we support in order to comply with the consumer data standards. And uh, now let's have a look at what, what other opportunities our open banking solution offers to the banks, uh, which goes beyond compliance. And uh, to present from this point onwards, I invite uh, Dasana. Hi, everyone. Um, so I believe uh, you guys have a good understanding about the key requirements on the compliance, and as well as how WS2 Open Banking Solution supports those uh, key requirements. Um, so if you look at WS2 Open Banking Solution, I would like to introduce uh, the Open Banking Solution as a platform of capabilities. So it's a single vendor solution. And it is based upon, uh, it was built using building blocks, uh, uh, digital transformation building blocks that have, have proven their capabilities. Um, if you look at uh, the deployments, uh, the, these building blocks have been deployed in Contas, AMP, Telstra, uh, Australian Catholic University, and those kind of um, institutions. So what we have done is we have built the open banking solution ground up using these building blocks. Um, WC2 has not acquired multiple companies or products and, and kind of build a package solution. This is a ground up, the uh, solution built ground up. So the um, solution provides uh, the multiple capabilities that supports the um, CDS specification and as well as it goes beyond that. So if you look at these different capabilities, um, I will start with open APIs. So we support standard open API specification three and um, so on top of the API specification defined by the compliance, we, we support other additional um, customized APIs and as well as uh, we could extend the, uh, the compliant APIs by adding additional resources, attributes, um, and, and some you know, structural elements. So we provide that extensibility on top of these open APIs. So you can come up with multiple um, additional APIs, uh, different ways of exposing your data and things like that. Um, data security, it's a very important element uh, in, in solution. So we provide transport security um, and as well as uh, security on data storage. Uh, we support different standards like you know PCI DSS and other standards and upcoming ISO standards within the open banking uh, regime. Uh, we provide multiple capabilities of integrations. Um, so how we handle integrating into banking system is we have the concept called adapters. So they encapsulate data model and communication model to these different systems. And we support enterprise integration patterns, all of those. Um, so we can communicate with messaging systems, we can communicate with APIs, we can communicate with um, different event-driven systems. 
we can um, you know work with uh, files um, static storages and things like that so those capabilities are built in so what you do is you configure and um, get those integrations working so you have all the tools that you require to use your existing systems like you know your co-banking system, digital banking system, credit card systems, your fraud monitoring system, and all of those. And we have built a, a, a feature with consumer consent management flows. Uh, we have built um, different perspectives in uh, consent management. One perspective is the uh, consumer's perspective, the self-care consent management portal. So the consumers can see and, and act on their concept. The other perspective is the bank's perspective where we call it as a concept admin portal, which banking administrators can work on the concept on behalf of the user. And it can be integrated into um, help desk or call center and, and take calls from consumer to um, change their concept and things like that. Um, these UIs, are based on uh, or aligned to the UX standards uh, defined by CDS specification uh, UK uh, UX guidelines, um, and as well as they can be kind of themed, um, you know, labeled with with your um, icons, uh, branding, and things like that. So it's white labeled, um, and we have the capability of detecting anomalies in interactions. Uh, support fraud detection. So those can be uh, kind of built using our stream processing capabilities. And we provide uh, ADR onboarding, uh, accredited data recipient onboarding using dynamic client registration flow. Uh, so we have built in uh, the old uh, capabilities around dynamic client registration. So it's configurable and it's extensible. And uh, for regulatory reporting, uh, we, we generate all the data that is required for uh, operational statistics from requests, uh, payloads to the interactions, the, the, the session context, and those metadata is being gathered within the open banking solution. And you can expose them through the get metrics API, which is defined by the CDS specification, and as well as you can use those metadata and as well as the actual data that is derived from those um, information that we gather and prepare reports and, and, and publish them as quarterly reports to ACCC. Um, so we provide a, a, um, extensive third-party lifecycle management capability. So you can bring in third parties into the open banking solution and manage their lifecycle. We provide strong consumer authentication. The, uh, the OIDC uh, hybrid flow uh, API security capability comes default, but you can augment that with other uh, API security mechanisms. Um, you can use um, you know, O2 extensions. You can use API keys. You can use you know, um, HTTP basic authentic uh, digest mechanisms. So you. There are a lot of capabilities uh, around security is able. You can pick and choose. Of course, the um, uh, the uh, regulatory compliance comes default, but it can be extended with other capabilities. Um, one of the highlights is the platform supports adaptive authentication and as well as multi-factor authentication. Although the current specification is read-only, it will evolve into read write mode. It will support payments in the future. So it is already covered within the solution uh, because the fundamental capabilities are available. The other capability that we provide on top of the bank, uh, open banking solution is the uh, developer portal. So developer portal provide a collaboration space uh, where developers can um, you know, test APIs. Uh, we provide sandboxes so they can trial some of the APIs. And it provides a kind of a social media experience. So you can work with multiple developers. You can create developer groups. You can have chat. You can have hackathons and things like that. 
So it, 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 it makes a collaborative uh, space for you. And bank can expose its capabilities into uh, this collaboration space and, and, and attract developers, fintechs, and other contributors um, as, as your partners in your uh, open banking journey. Um, so this is, these are the capabilities that we provide as a single vendor solution. Um, and, and most of these uh, capabilities are provided on standard specifications. So you're not tying up to a vendor, although it's a single vendor solution. And if you look at open banking solution, it's a, a modular, it has a modular architecture and have multiple modules, as you can see on this diagram. So we have API management module, identity access module, integration module, and analytics module. Um, so each of these modules interact with standard, intera using standard interaction models that are APIs and events. Uh, so you can kind of, so although you have multiple modules, these are loosely coupled. And you can pick and choose what are the modules that you want. So you don't need to you know, get all of these modules based on your capabilities or uh, existing capabilities within your ecosystem. You may choose uh, different modules. Uh, so we have experience, uh, we, have, uh, we have deployed open banking solution with only having API management and identity access management. So the integration and analytical capability came from existing systems from the bank. Likewise, you can kind of pick and choose capabilities and build the open banking experience. Uh, if you look at this individual module, the API management uh, module provide the API design time and as well as the API runtime. So it provides the developers to ability to create APIs, modify APIs, and deploy those APIs. And on top of that, the API security is configurable. And it provides the developer portal as well. The identity access management provides the uh, implement the API security. And it, it implements the consent management flow and as well as provide the additional capabilities of you know, adaptive authentication, strong customer authentication, and things like that. And then comes the integration module. The integration module provide the ability to interact with other systems. And uh, so what we do with the integration module is we abstract those uh, integrations to other systems because when you're integrating with a different system, you need to handle different data models and different protocols. Um, so what, what we do with the integration module is, is we ab abstract uh, those data model differences and communication protocol differences within the integration module. And analytics provides the um, dashing, dashboard capability on API analytics and other um, analytical models. Um, and as well as provide transaction risk analysis and fraud detection. Um, and, and provide business insights as well. And uh, so, so th this is the modular architecture that we have. And um, it can be deployed in an in a open banking uh, ecosystem in, in, as shown in this diagram. So the open banking a platform supports multiple deployment models. It can be deployed on bare metal, it can be deployed on VMs, it can be deployed on cloud, uh, hybrid cloud, and as well as in -contain. So since it is supporting multiple deployment models, the banking platform can be within the internal bank network or it can be deployed outside, let's say on cloud, and interacting with your internal banking network through APIs, or through a VPN. And as, as I said earlier, so we have this integration module abstracting integration into co-banking systems, uh, credit card systems, digital banking system, the utility services and things like that. And as well as it will interact with uh, other services like notification services, templating systems, um, locking systems and things like that. And what happens is, living within the internal bank network or within the ecosystem, it will 
expose data and capability of the banks to the third parties outside. And of course, it's through a standard mechanism complying with CDS specification. And on top, on top of that, you can uh, provide additional APIs and additional capabilities as well. So if you look at how um, the, you know, customer, merchants, and other banks would interact with uh, open banking platform is, so we have we provide this developer portal, which provide a collaboration space. And we provide API. And even going beyond that, we can provide non-API ways of collaboration, like, you know, um, a messaging system endpoints, and if it is APIs, and we can support multiple API uh, API model. Not only the banks, we we, we integrate with A Triple C as well, like other regulatory bodies uh, in the reporting and, uh, and and as well as querying different metadata aspects, querying security aspects, and things like that. So this is how it fits into the um, you know overall ecosystem uh, within the existing systems. So now you understand like um, how um, you know, open banking uh, solution fits into the UI ecosystem and it, how it provides capabilities around your compliance. And it goes beyond compliance. It provides more capabilities on top of um, the compliance because it's a platform of capability. Uh, the, the, the key features that is made available on this platform is to ability to integrate other APIs and customize APIs. And you can create API products, uh, bundling different APIs as well. And of course, uh, it supports additional API security features like you know standard O2, uh, IDA certificate validation uh, on top of OIDZ. Um, it provides strong custom authentication, adaptive authentication, and user consent management, and you know different variations of uh, of uh, providing security. And as well as it provides different rapid deployment packages of APIs. Like, so the uh, WSU Open Banking product comes with PRD APIs as package. So you can immediately deploy those capabilities. And we provide API analytics, um, business insights, dashboarding capability, uh, data reporting capabilities as well. Um, as, as I said earlier, like we provide different integration points supporting multiple enterprise integration pattern, uh, which provide uh, connectivity to your existing banking systems. Uh, we provide uh, GDPR and uh, multiple other standards. And, and, and most important thing is, it, everything comes together to provide you a more feature rich, more wholesome experience on top of open banking. So WSU open banking solution is in its core is a digital transformation platform. So you can use this to uh, your digital transformation journey within the bank to come up, come out of your traditional banking silo and look at a more agile, more flexible, and uh, you know, uh, a way of providing banking experience to your customers. So that's what we provide. We provide a digital banking platform, sorry, digital transformation uh, platform, which open banking comes as default. Um, moving on. So this is the extensibility that is provided by platform captured in a, in a diagram. So as you can see, uh, we provide a mechanism of defining APIs and hosting APIs, and it supports many uh, you know, API definition standards. We support open standards. And it can be with different protocols like you know gRPC, GraphQL, um, REST, SOAP, any type of API um, uh, exposure pro protocols. Um, and we provide not only banking APIs, we provide infosec APIs as well, the token APIs, the user info APIs, and things like that. And when you expose additional APIs, customize APIs. You may want to monetize those. You you can provide more value out of that. Um, so that's where the monetizing mod, the capability of creating monetization models comes in. So you can expose these APIs and earn money on top of that. 
So you can bring in pay as you go models, tier models, and you know, different variations of API monetization model. And we provide the engagement landscape using uh, API sandbox and API marketplace. Um, so you can expose uh, these capabilities, these uh, experiences to your partners, so they can come and see what are the APIs available and what 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 would be the behavior of these APIs, and use sandbox to test their application, their integrations, and things like that. And we provide a lot of developer content and as well as synthetic data within uh, the open banking solution. Um, WSO2 itself has done a lot of hackathon using the same platform. So we, we, we share those expertise with you as well. And the on the other side, we provide uh, dashboarding and portals for consent management and, and consent lifecycle management. Uh, so we can use or extend that capability to support additional value that you provide on top of that. Uh, so we provide data and identity integration so you can use your existing identity stores and as well as uh, different systems that you already have in your ecosystem within uh, within within the open banking and we we provide a uh, comprehensive business intelligence component uh, which is both ba uh, based on stream uh, stream analytical model and we can generate patterns and we can generate models and we can Kind of predict behavior of um, you know consumers partners uh, based on their interaction with the system and we can work with real-time information and as well as historical information and it can be transformed into real-time dashboards um, and we provide tooling around that as well. so this is what we provide on top of open banking as a digital transformation package an extensible platform. So that's the benefit that you're getting out of um, WSU Open Banking solution. And the other thing is we, so we have this solution and we have packages as well. So we have built a package for um, especially targeting smaller banks like, you know, smaller credit unions, um, you know, building societies and things like that. So we, we call it as a two day stage one compliance package. So this is a managed cloud uh, deployment, which is managed by WS2 Managed Services. Uh, this is targeting stage one contains, which is uh, only uh, looking at exposing product information, product and product details, and, and those are read-only APIs and non-secure APIs. Um, so what we provide is we provide the pack, the compliance as a package, and as well as it it bundles up our regulatory expertise and you know, the our maturity in delivering technology to large customers. Uh, so the headache of compliance will be handled by WC to behalf of you. And this is only stage one, but for the stage two, we will provide more comprehensive uh, a, a roadmap and as well as um, open banking platform uh, to, to comply with stage two as well. Um, moving on. So let's look at um, one of the customer uh, success stories that we have. Um, so one of the leading Australian bank has chosen us as their WS2 open banking platform. Um, the reason being we have a componentized architecture. Uh, so we have, uh, we, we are being a single vendor solution and we are deployment neutral. That means we can deploy it in anywhere. And as well as we come with uh, the, the open banking expertise across the globe. So it's not just platform, it's both platform and the expertise and, and our, um, you know, reputed supporting model, support model, WC2 support model. And they chose us not only for open banking compliance, they chose us for their digital transformation journey. They want to become, or they want to come out of their traditional banking silo and become a, 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 a challenger. They want to create a meaningful, authentic experience, a banking experience to the customers. So we are we are providing technology and we are part of their um, you know uh, lead the thought process of becoming a digital bank, becoming a digital uh, part of their digital banking journey. 
So let's look at how they achieve and how we supported them. Right? So this is a journey. This is not a, like a stop, right? So it's not just about technology. It's not just about supporting something, right? So it's a journey. So if you look at this journey and how it evolved, so first, what we did was we worked with their teams, the architecture, security, marketing, and business, and we uh, built a concept called the design workshop, open banking platform design workshop. So everyone sit together and 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 came up with first they first what we did was we analyzed what are the capabilities that are available within the bank, and what is what is our roadmap, and then we created this uh, you know high level architecture and the design. The outcome of that activity was the detailed design. Uh, so not only the bank, the partners got involved because partners are benefiting at the end, right? Then we will look at the, uh, we will went on a traditional uh, waterfall model where we made project plans, estimates, and things like that. And it then comes the implementation. So as I told you early, this is a journey. So in order to like take this journey, we need to change the culture within the bank. There should be a cultural shift. People uh, from developers to advisors to bankers need to embrace the, uh, the need of agility, the need of flexibility and need of providing an authentic banking experience to uh, the banking consumer, especially the um, younger generation, right? So. In order to do that, the entire cult, between the culture, the banking culture has to step out of that, you know, traditional banking notion. Um, so you need to keep the trust and the security that banks are uh, banks proven, but you have to be agile uh, in developing new products, new services. So we help the bank to make that cultural shift. And we provide us tools and technologies. We provide us content. We provide expertise um, because this is bread and butter for us. So we helped uh, to augment their engineers. We provided uh, improve their systems, and then build the implementation, and then move on to testing. Again, in testing, we help them because we are working with uh, the government regulation. We are contributing to the conformance suite, the CDS conformance suite. And as well as we can bring the experience that we have gathered from other regions, like the open banking in Europe, the emerging uh, open banking initiatives in Mexico, uh, Singapore, the, the things happening in Singapore and like that. Then when you are done with the testing, we, we, went, we went for go live. So we, we are compliant. Uh, so we are compliant. Now we are looking at how we can extend this platform how we can build broader capability. Because in, in compliance, you are using only 20% of your capabilities uh, in your platform. So we will move that to a more uh, uh, more richer uh, platform with, uh, with the journey. And then comes, uh, we provide services on top of the platform, uh, which make a bank uh, more of a challenger bank rather than a traditional bank. So these key services are the full life cycle support through design delivery and maintenance, and as well as beyond. And we provide advisor, uh, advisor capabilities on the current com uh, open banking compliance specification and as well as future compliances because we work with the regulatory, the publishers changes to the uh, specification we um, we have discussions against these specifications. We recommend some of the features. Uh, so we are we are we are um, kind of you know we are current with the specification, um, and then we we provide building competitive advantage. We uh, contributing go to market strategies and commercial business model because, as I said earlier, this is about beyond open banking. So it's not only the technology, but we would shape banks roadmap uh, in their market strategy and uh, business model, how to provide value. Um, so we provide multiple model of consultancies on expanding the platform um, uh, to utilize you know, beyond regulatory compliance and, and of course enhance um, return of investment. So these services are packaged 
with the open banking solution. Uh, moving on. So this is what we provide as open banking solution. The, the, the key learning point is we, we are not just providing a platform. We are not just, just not providing a compliance. We provide beyond that. So this is further strengthened in, in our uh, webinar that we have planned uh, along with uh, Open Banking World Congress. Um, so I will be presenting details about um, you know our global experience. Uh, you know, looking at what we have done in um, Europe, in the UK, what we had, we have done with State Berlin Group, OB UK, and as well as the work that we are doing with Mexico, Singapore, and other regions, uh, and as well as um, the work that we are doing with uh, CDR. Um, in not only in banking but again like the other other uh, verticals as well so i will be sharing those uh, experiences and as well as some of the reference uh, architectures um, um, uh, in, in this webinar um, so i believe with this um, we come to the end of our webinar uh, please uh, feel free to um, you know share in your questions or any feedback on this. Thank you very much. Okay, um, so we have a question from the audience. Um, it's a very good question. Um, uh, so the question is how WC2 Open Banking solution uh, provide integration capabilities uh, to legacy systems? Uh, what are the features available integrating into um, legacy systems so yes uh, so when it comes to legacy systems uh, what we do is like uh, we have adapters that we have built and as well as we can build uh, so if you look at the adapters it's based on a standard template um, so you can use existing connectors that that is available on the connector store against a specific uh, legacy system or you can extend and build a connector into your legacy system if it is using a non-standard communication protocol or non-standard data model so that extend uh, that um, extensibility is provided by the integration platform um, so most of the legacy system that we come across is based on COBOL uh, IBM mainframes and things like that um, yeah so um, so that capability is available on the open banking solution. Um, so when it comes to extending the platform, WC2 itself provides the, the, the capability as services, or WC2 partners can be uh, leveraged to provide that um, services as well. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, um, hope to see you in other webinars that we have planned um, in, in this series of webinars. Thank you very much.